Um, it has been my pleasure to have Ellen in workshop at the Divide Writers Center in my class and in several other classes. Um, Ellen has published so many poems from both of her full length manuscripts and she's going to read some of those for all of you today. You can read more about Ellen in the chat when Sophia posts it. Um, Ellen, thank you so much for being with, here, with us here today. Please everyone help me welcome Ellen June Wright. Hello everyone. I'm going to actually read a sequence of poems from my manuscript. The working title is Angela, and I'll read the introduction just to give you um, a little background on who Angela is. Um, in August of 1619, a British ship landed near Jamestown, Virginia, with dozens of enslaved Africans the first black people in the colonies that would become the United States. The Africans who came in Virginia in 1619 had been taken from Angola in West Africa. Angela appears in the historical record just twice as part of censuses conducted in Virginia colony in February 16, 1624 and January 24, 1625. In the first, she is one of the colony's 21 Africans, identified as Angelo, a Nagar, and living in James City. Um, there's a short poem at the introduction. It says, um, eulogy, let not bondage be the end of you. Let your spirit find its way back to where you took in your first air and cried your way into the world, into your sable mother's waiting arms. In memory of Angela, enslaved to arrive before the Mayflower after Natasha Trethlin. The home we knew is only memory. It repeats and never changes. We're forever young, forever children playing in the yard, kicking stones, chasing birds, um, taking too long to answer a mother's call. Mother is so much older now or in her grave, though in the home inside you, she is always young and lovely, dark skin glistening in the midday sun as she stews meat for the afternoon meal and the spice heavy aroma is carried on the wind even across the ocean. If you take a deep breath, Angela, you can taste the meal she prepared the last day you saw her. My mind wanders down to the darkness. Some mornings after prayer, my mind wanders down to the darkness of the lower decks, to the women packed in like dry goods upon a shelf, hardly room to stretch their legs, their arms. I feel them there in the discomfort of womanhood, moon phases passing through their bodies during a long ship's journey or pregnancy filling their wombs and abdominal muscles separating. I have to pull myself away from sisters who groan and cry for the unknown fate they face. Today, I'm going to enjoy the freedom that's mine in remembrance of women in the lower decks who could only imagine the luxury of ample interior space. I'm going to eat a hearty meal for them. I'm going to read because they could not. I'm going to write this because I can. What they carried with them. They carried everything one can bring when one can bring nothing. They carried everything they knew, languages and dialects, songs mothers taught them as babes and antebellum blues sung as prisoners of war, 
memories of their homes, terrain, mountains and valleys, grasslands and vast lands, recipes of how to cook everything they had ever eaten, recipes locked inside of how to prepare this peas and that rice grain, how to stew this meat and for how many hours. What they brought with them was everything. They were, they were not material. They brought their culture, the parts that mattered, religion and mathematics, the knowledge of healing locked inside plant and bark, knowledge of stars, memories of love and family, children and grandchildren, parents left behind, homes they would never see again. What they brought with them was everything that one can carry when one is in fetters. The seeds of children to be born in exile. What they brought with them was everything one can bring when one can bring nothing. Angela. Angela from the African region known as Angola, tall, dark, thin, sinewy, flat chested, prepubescent, grower of figs, keeper of pigs, recorded as Angelo, watched over by angels for whom she was named, survived the crossing in a ship's bowels, survived pirates and disease, traded as cargo, first African woman recorded on the land that became America, Jamestown, Virginia, distant outpost of the British Empire. Before the Mayflower landed, she was here, distant outpost of the British Empire that became America, Jamestown, Virginia, first African woman recorded on the land survived pirates and disease, traded as cargo, survived the crossing in a ship's bowels, watched over by angels for whom she was named, grower of figs, keeper of pigs, recorded as Angelo, tall, dark, thin, sinewy, flat-chested, prepubescent Angela from the African region known as Angola. I imagine you slim, even slender. A teen walking with jug on your head, practicing domestic arts you've learned since you could understand Fire is hot and wa water boiling scorches skin. I imagine you standing at the entrance of your home made of mud or willowy twigs woven together. I imagine you listening from a distance to men as they speak of war and raids, as they speak of ghostly men who want to trade and spread their religion. Men who buy people and carry them away as though they are sheaves of grain bundled, strange harvest of limbs and lives. I imagine your grandmother motioning to your mother as you walk towards them, how lovely you are, how strong. You should have been married long ago. And then you are gone. under the fig tree. When you sit under the glossy leaf fig tree, claiming a free moment between endless rounds of cooking, cleaning, lighting the fire and hauling water, from before the sun comes up to after Master Pierce and family sleep in their beds. When you think of Ndongo, and the Mbandu people, when you think of your rivers, Suenza and Lukala, your hills, your valleys, all that ties a woman to their homelands, 
your mother's countenance, your father's voice as he called you back, knowing you had strayed too far. When, you're, when the solitary moment passes and you return to your labors, hold and dongo inside. Whisper the names of all you knew, but will never see again. Call them in Kimbandu, the way you were taught to call ancestors, though you don't know if they're alive or dead. Repeat your first name like a song as you toss slop to your pigs, as you fill the trough. Whisper words forbidden, the sweet name your parents called you before enemies force marched you to the coast, sold you to the Portuguese, who branded you, baptized you, and chained you in the belly of a ship. Angela dreams of wing. During brief hours of sleep, night, soot, thick stars and crescent moons, the only light, wings emerge, travel back across devouring waves. This time, not chained and fettered in the rump of a boat. This time, sail currents of air. Angela, angel, fly home. It's still there. Your mother wakes each morning, longing to see you. Your father's broken, having lost his beloved girl. And when you fly, bid farewell to no one. You owe them nothing. You were never chattel. You held, only held against your will. They profited from evil, even as they sang, a mighty fortress is our God. Even as they quoted scripture, bond servants, obey your earthly masters. Never willing to trade places with you. Angela, take flight, fly home each night, sleep on the pallet that was yours, familiar and warm. Narcissus, reflection of your dark face in a barrel's water after heavy rain. You're fascinated by your own carved features, your high cheekbones, your hair, you, the hair you struggle with each morning, having no palm oil, your cowrie eyes so different from when they were home, Morning sunlight cuts across the surface, divides your reflection in half from light to dark. You stare at your face as if looking at the moon, yet so close you reach for her and hold her. But like a shade from the field of asphodel, she washes away in your arms. And this is the last one that I'm going to do. It's called Judith Beheading Halifernes. No one ever read the book of Judith to the enslaved, recounting how she freed Halifernes of his head as he lie in a drunken stupor. I watch Wiley's black Judith defiant gaze holding a sword after beheading a white woman. And I think of Angela and the head severing rage she must have felt. The rage I'm struggling to put in her mouth. Although she would have had every right, I cannot find the will to put a sword in her hand like Kehende and send her into Pierce's house to destroy the family, not even the indentured servants, believing what I believe. I can't put an ax in our hand and wield to wield for anything but chopping wood for fire making. Though she would have every right to free herself, leaving a wake of bloody muck behind her. I don't have it in me to make her a murderer. I don't have it in me to put poison in her hands. Maybe I have a mind enslaved, trained to be 
submissive, waiting for my benevolent, benevolent master, even after watching another officer execute a brother bullet to the back of his skull, a routine stop gone wrong, fills me with rage, but I don't have it in me to put a sword in Angela's hand. I don't yet have a warrior's heart. Thank you so much, Ellen. Um, these poems are so powerful and so important, especially in light of what is going on all over the country and in Florida where DeSantis wants to say that um, slaves learn some good lessons for being slave. So thank you, Ellen, for your work and your words and um, your, your poems of, of real protest and resistance and history. Um, it was wonderful to hear them, as someone said in the chat, one after another, without any, any talk in between, really powerful work. Um, and now we are going to hear poems from Jill Michelle, um, who has been studying at the Hudson Valley Writers Center with Joan Kwan Glass, who is here in the audience today. So. Um, Thank you, Jill Michelle. Thank you, Joan Kwan Glass, for all of your work and all of your words. Um, we can't stop getting enough praise from um, the students for Joan, and we're just really happy that she has joined our community um, for the past year. So, Jill, thank you so much for being with us, and we're really looking forward to hearing you. Thank you so much. And thank you to Joan. It was an absolutely incredible class, the Cathedral of Dead Bolts. Um, and thank you for hosting this gathering and giving us the opportunity to read our work. I'm going to flip things around a little bit for transition for what I was going to do um, and do the poem I was going to end with first, because um, I think it it works a little better. Um, this is a protest poem. Um, it is in the Rise Up Review. Um, in the winter issue. I'm gonna put a content warning on it for gun violence. And because I get nervous and more anxious when a content warning is mentioned and sometimes don't take care of myself because I'm worried like, when is the poem gonna end? I'm gonna go ahead and um, and I'll, I'll just say this could be a little intense for some folks. And so I'm gonna give a little heart sign at the end so that if you need to mute, you can mute and you will know exactly when the poem is done and it's safe to return to us. So here we go. Gun, after Sylvia Plath. I am harmless and a killer. Loaded like an uncle on his third martini, I spit venom whichever way my mouth is pointed, regardless of innocence. Out of my case, I open cases. Paperwork muse, author of futures, I ride, clipped to the belted hips of officers. Black L with triggered middle. Trigger pull, pulling parts apart, a part of families forever departed, my blanks you cannot fill. Now I am bass beats, background notes woven into your favorite song. You dance to me, arms raised, until the bodies begin to fall. I am the last reason you'll reach for those you hold most dear, a litmus test of loving. Chameleon, I turn to fireworks outside the club, a bungled experiment in the next classroom, engine backfire by the grocery. I'll keep feeding on your innocence. You just keep ignoring me. Okay, so the next uh, poems are all, um, going to be about uh, the loss of my two children. Um, I lost my son, Corey, in when my water broke in February of 2007 at 21 weeks. And then the doctor said it was just bad luck, try again. And so we did. And then the same thing happened uh, in February of the next year. 
And so a lot of my poems deal with that. Um, they also try to um, explain um, the effect of having um, PTSD from a sexual assault and then how that can relate to like having medical procedures. So there will be some of that as well. This first piece was published in an awesome project that I highly recommend to everyone. It's called Please See Me. Um, it is a, a journal that is meant to improve um, the healthcare field by increased by art and communication between patients, caregivers, and medical workers. Um, and this is called This is the Floor Where No Babies Are Saved. The first time you're wheeled up to Winnie Palmer's eighth floor, you don't know. The shock has not worn off. The tile shines, hypnotizes, hotel-like. Then the chair is parked at the nurse's station, a check-in desk to this resort no one wanted. The first time you swaddle your hope, hold it close, pray so hard it hurts for the doctors to be wrong, for your son to hang on for a few more weeks, enough time to make the tiny set of lungs he needs. The first time you don't know a baby at 21 weeks is beautiful, the size of your hand. The first time you don't know as you're wheeled back out, a scrap of your soul will stay packed away for a year in a closet full of shoe boxes, row upon row of unimaginable loss and two small footprints. The second time, you know. This next piece, um, whew, I'm gonna take a drink first because this is a workout. This one appeared in Hole in the Head Review um, and is called How to Get the Guy Between Your Legs to Say You're Rare and Interesting. Lose one child, listen to the doctors. Try again in eight weeks, listen to the doctors. At the right time of month, listen to the doctors. Track it on a calendar, listen to the doctors. Make sex no fun, listen to the doctors. Find your pregnant in fall, listen to the doctors. See the high risk once a month, listen to the doctors. Be a broken well, listen to the doctors. Lift nothing over five pounds, listen to the doctors. Your rope is split, listen to the doctors. No laundry baskets, listen to the doctors. No confused daughter, listen to the doctors. Choke down these horse pills, listen to the doctors. Drink OJ like water, listen to the doctors. Make it to 12 weeks, listen to the doctors. Tell your family, listen to the doctors. Start bleeding at 15, listen to the doctors. Change to weekly appointments, listen to the doctors. Then get admitted, listen to the doctors. After your sonogram, listen to the doctors. Stare at ultrasound strips, listen to the doctors. Trace the block print, listen to the doctors. It's a girl, listen to the doctors. Get in bed, listen to the doctors. Try not to stress, listen to the doctors. Move as little as you can, listen to the doctors. We need more tests, listen to the doctors. Pee in this bucket, listen to the doctors. Wake up to needle tips, listen to the doctors. Thermometer communion, listen to the doctors. Too many gloved hands, listen to the doctors. Rubber fingerprints, listen to the doctors. Be touched by everyone, listen to the doctors. When you want to be touched by no one, listen to the doctors. Lose yourself in mantra, listen to the doctors. A speculum split you open, listen to the doctors. It's for the baby, listen to the doctors. For the baby you can do this. Listen to the doctors. Let them touch you. Listen to the doctors. You can do this. Listen to the doctors. Stare at the doorway. Listen to the doctors. To the room of lost sons. Listen to the doctors. You're crying too much. Listen to the doctors. Beg to go home. Listen to the doctors. Buy weekly appointments. Listen to the doctors. 
Find your regular specialists, listen to the doctors. Is on vacation, listen to the doctors. When the snow-capped stranger, listen to the doctor. Shows up instead of her, listen to the doctor. Read your swollen file, listen to the doctor. As you wait in stirrups, listen to the doctor. From between your bent knees, listen to the doctor. It's for the baby, listen to the doctor. Don't worry about the blood, listen to the doctor. DNA test is back. Listen to the doctor. Oh, look at that. Listen to the doctor. You're rare and interesting. Listen to the doctor. Compound heterozygous. Listen to the doctor. On a blood clotting gene. Listen to the doctor. That doesn't sound good. Listen to the doctor. He squeezes your socked foot. Listen to the doctor. Instead of kicking him, listen to the doctor. You can do this. Listen to the doctor. Does this mean you can save her? Listen to the doctor. Shuffle papers. Listen to the doctor. Well, honey, listen to the doctor. It's for the... So this next one is dedicated to another teacher of mine named Eugenia Lee. Um, I wrote it during her class um, and it's called Triptych to Wreck Diving. I put on the body armor of black rubber, the absurd flippers, the grave and awkward mask, Adrian Rich. Here's the past's bruised girl, herself a woman, hope spun. A poem, brutal present, glue stuck on bed rest, an island unreachable. To stitch tides to butterfly cocoons, the future bone-throated but glimmering. Here's a poem to stitch the past brutal tides to bruised present, butterfly girl glue stuck cocoons herself on bed rest, the future a woman, an island, bone-throated, hope spun, unreachable, but glimmering. Finally, I'd like to close with uh, three short prose poems uh, that first appeared in a wonderful magazine that I love called DMQ Review. Bed rest at Winnie Palmer. In this poem, it wasn't all for nothing. 10 days of bedside peeing in white construction buckets in view of the room where we lost our son. The social worker, suited siren waiting from the shores of sanity, worried I'm crying too much. The stuttered crawl of the wall clocks second hand Ticking off another minute, I've kept our daughter safe, kept her inside, kept her this time long enough. When the therapist asks if I can stop grieving babies lost 10 years ago. This time I agree to pack them up. The palm-sized sun, the pink-capped nurses dressed in tiny train pajamas, delivered in a wicker basket, perfect, except for the stillness, which I'll tuck next to the empty visage of his sister, whisked away and cut before I could, so I never would see her in anything but these thin strips of already fading prints, ultrasound Rorschachs I let fall in this box of loss beside February dreams in which my children breathe and I live. When I join the Borg Collective, they will finally stop all these feelings piled up like drone parts, nanoprobes to grow my replacement heart, the metal kind, this time impenetrable. I wait, mind stilled, a smoked bee, no more poems will be necessary. No need to make sense of dandelion seeds, poet shot on Myanmar streets. The hive will assimilate it all. No need for speech. 
while the queen, collector of sorrows, scatters the bits of me, flips the M upside down, turns me to we, finally and finally. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was really moving. Thank you um, for all of you for being here today. We're going to hear the work of Misty Yarnell next. She is a prose writer. She also uh, happens to work for the Hudson Valley Writer Center. We are very lucky to have her, especially with our youth programming. And she is one of Jonathan Vatner's students. So uh, we're really thrilled to have Misty here today to read for us. Thank you so much, Misty. Thank you, Jennifer, for that very kind introduction. Um, so the piece I'll be reading today is titled Baby Steps, and it's published in the most recent edition of Italics Mine. Uh, and this is actually an excerpt from a longer form novella that I'm writing. So I hope you enjoy. Baby Steps. You scan the aisle for baby clothes, searching for yellow. Gender neutral is always a safe bet. Pulling a newborn onesie from the rack, you hold it away from your body and scan it up and down and focus on the little feet. How something, someone could fit inside this tiny outfit and how something, someone that size could come out of your body. You put the onesie in the blue shopping basket looped around your elbow. Next, you find a little olive green corduroy dress with brown buttons on the straps. You could always redonate if the baby is a boy. Aren't boys allowed to wear dresses now anyway? You select another three or four outfits, a red knit sweater, jean overalls with Elmo embroidered on the chest, stretchy pink pants. Another woman enters the aisle and you find your way out on the other side. One want a crowd, you reason with yourself. There's a whole section in Goodwill dedicated to maternity, but you have no idea how big you'll be next month or in June. Instead, you make your way to the t-shirts, pulling a variety of 2XL. At the register, you ask for a fitting room. The middle-aged woman doesn't even bat an eye at your inappropriately sized choices and grabs the key. You follow her back. She unlocks it without even looking at you, but you thank her anyway. The hangers intertangle with one another. One by one, you take the sweaters and t-shirts out of the basket and shimmy them over your head. You pay close attention to the space between your body and the fabric. Being one to always select items to complement your curves, you consider how frumpy and terrible pregnancy will look on you. Some women glow. You haven't washed your hair in six days. You peel off the shirt, focusing on your figure, you think your tummy sticks out a little bit farther than normal, but it might just be your anxiety playing its trickery. Your breasts bulge at the seams of your bra and they hurt, the first symptom that keyed you into taking a test. It looks terrible. You put it all back, the oversized shirts, the little outfits, lapping the aisles, you place each item where it originated on the rack, just like you were never here as if prolonging the inevitable shopping would stop this pregnancy from progressing. There was still time to change your mind. Your father was dead. Your mother-in-law lived in DC and would never find out. Tom told you it was your decision. How sweet. He always respected your autonomy more than most of your touchy ex-boyfriends ever did. But this wasn't just your decision. You wanted him to weigh in, to want this baby. Maybe then you would want it a little more too. Maybe the more you forced yourself to look at the baby clothes, the more you would want this. You go home and you take a nap. God, why are you always so tired? At this point, it would be discouraging to not keep the pregnancy considering your body is already pouring so much energy into creating him or her. Tom walks into the bedroom 
and you realize it must have been the sound of the front door shutting that woke you up. There was nothing ready for dinner. In your previous life, before the pregnancy, you always had dinner at least on the stove before Tom came home from work. The hygienist criticized you for always insisting on seven to three shifts so you'd be home in time to cook dinner for your husband. But it was one responsibility in your marriage you actually enjoyed. Tom lays beside you in bed and without a word, pulls you into a hug. You know this is bothering him too. He's a man of routine, always working the same shifts, eating dinner at the same time, playing something with guns on his Xbox before bed. Coming home to no dinner is just the first step to your whole marriage molding into something neither of you know. The two of you had seldom conversations about the pregnancy thus far. It was a silence you both felt comfortable in. Two income household, newly married couple, 30s quickly approaching, the baby is right on cue. He doesn't question when you start crying. He just hugs a little tighter, an unspoken language in your marriage. No matter what emotion spitballs through your body, a hug will always ground you back into reality. But this time it doesn't. You find yourself fidgeting and fighting the hug, constantly uncomfortable. God, why couldn't he just say something? You wanna crawl out of your own skin and leave a mold of you behind, give him something to hold on to while you figure this out on your own. There's only so many weeks before you don't get a choice anymore. You wake up early in the next morning and drive back to Goodwill. Entering the store, you gravitate over to the baby clothes and find the yellow onesie still squished between other tiny outfits. You only buy the one. Thank you. Thank you so much, Misty. That was wonderful. Thank you for sharing that piece with us today. Um, now we are going to hear another one of Joan Kwan Glass's students, Donna. Welcome, we're so happy to hear you read today. Thank you, uh, thank you for having all of us here. It's a pleasure um, to read to an audience of people who are also um, always working on their words. Um, I'm gonna read uh, mostly recent poems um, and most of them that have been published online, but I'll end with uh, one that I wrote in uh, Joan's class. So I'm just gonna kind of go through them. Here we go. Um, the first one is called, This is the Story. And this appeared in Stone Circle Review, which is a wonderful new journal if you're looking for places to submit. This is the story. A fox at midnight. Vines of moonflowers creamy in the low glow of their namesake. Night blooming morning glory. Ipamoa Alba but a lovely moment explained loses its magic. The fleshy droop of a cherry is not delicious on its own, so much trouble to remove the stone, the hands stained scarlet. Some things need to be sugared, soft enough to swallow. At the shore, messages written in the sand disappear. Write, stay, write, I miss you and the surf erases it. Move back, repeat on a drier canvas. Language need not be permanent to be true. Better with faces than with names, better with words than numbers. My reward is stories and forgetting. Better with blankets than mirrors. Under the blankets, some forgetting hurts less. This is the story. A woman went to the ocean. The air was thick and misty and she swallowed it, greedy for sweetness. The hourglass continued its slow sieve to stillness, time a stone and a cherry. This is the story. The woman was alone. She thought she heard the wind whisper, stay. Then a rustle behind her, a fox, in the reeds, a little magic beneath a crescent moon. Um, this next poem was off 
finalist for the Kessler Prize at Harper Palette, um, which I was very excited about because uh, it's an important poem to me. Um, this one is called Dysmorphia Autumn. I dig to the bottom of the suitcase to find something warm, wool to welcome the holy season of covering up. I've read that any set of thighs can look desirable in the right light, but somehow the light is always wrong. Though here in the woods, far from my usual disguises, the light is sugared with stars, showered with meteors, shimmered with ash and shotgun shells. The cashier at the grocery store says there hasn't been a shooting for months, so I can take off my safety vest. Relieved to no longer be so visible, I walk, shifting my shame from heel to ball and back again. No one has shoveled the should-haves, piles of them strewn in a shambles, all the paths I didn't take. Once I had a student who carried a lemon in his coat because he liked the way it made his fingers smell. I admire that kind of commitment but I'd rather pocket a pine cone, rough and unraveling its loud and spiny mouth. I'd rather be that open, but my hours of operation keep changing. When I reach the shore of the river, a battered canoe could be a steamship from this distance. It could be my Titanic. It could be my ticket out. Um, the next one I'm going to read, the title actually functions as the first line. So I'll just go right in and start. And this was published in um, Moist Poetry. Everything is terrible. And yet the fields are full of seed, sprouts and leaves and rain. I wear this irksome suit of flesh and, and yet... The fields are scented, sweet with dirt and singing. I watch my days fall and die like embers, and yet the fields are tangled with grasses and asters. I smile a cruel curve, a drawn bow, and yet the fields are recycling the soft wreckage of harvest. I hate like a god hates when it is forgotten. And yet the fields are still in love with green. Um, this next one uh, was published in Bieber magazine, another small magazine, which I love. Um, and this is a uh, kind of a, a little bit of comic relief here. And a lot of these poems have been kind of, uh, you know, really amazing today, but very heavy. Um, it does feature an F-bomb. So if swearing, you know, offends you, then be forewarned. Um, here we go. This is called Heaven Only Knows. My roots are Russian and German, making me 80% Bond villain. But I smile too often to ever be convincing. And besides, I was raised to be good to never leave anyone out. It's how my mother lived, my father insisting that her gravestone be engraved with the phrase, friend to all. Her openness, a legend, every cashier and server and kid on the block drawn into her welcoming circle. And if it is true that the dead watch over us, then my mother is flinching at the way I throw the word fuck around like confetti, though she once scored 100 points spelling genitals in a Scrabble game. My father perches on my shoulder whenever I make a purchase or a decision. Do you really need that? Is that what you really want to do? And then he offers me a shot of brandy for my migraines, which I do not want or need. It comforts to imagine them holding up numerical placards like ice skating officials every time I write a poem or pull the weeds or clean the kitchen, always a nine or ten, their judgment colored by love and distance. But with that distance, each day they grow a little fainter. And it scares me. 
In my earliest memory, my father prepared to scale and gut the catch my brothers had pulled from the lake, and I plugged my ears. I didn't want to hear the fish scream. But I am listening now. In the night, I hear them. When will you stop writing about grief? And I'm just going to read a couple more, um, especially to keep us on time here. Um, I'm going to read a newer poem, and then I'm going to end with one I wrote in Joan's class. Um, this, uh, I also started in a, cl a class that offered a prompt. Then sometimes you get a prompt and you're like, uh, no, <laughs> I can't write about that. Um, and so this is where that comes from. It's called Asked to Write About My Past Lives. I consider that the only good answer would come from an atom. Imagine its anguish at being the explosive point of a bullet, the sulfur on an arsonist's match head, or a more subtle sadness, like a lush piece of fruit left to rot on the vine. Imagine its delight in an incarnation as an infant's soft fontanelle or new car smell, or the clear light that dapples the grass after weeks of dark skies and rain. Perhaps it's like the television show Quantum Leap, where the atom jumps from its, into its new form without any warning and adjusts on the fly, from a guillotine's blade to a jar of gray poupon, from a splinter in a lion's paw to a house cat's toy feather, from a drop of sweat at a Caligulan orgy to the wrapper of a condom. Or maybe atoms move in connected trajectories, a venerate old forest oak becoming a log, becoming a cabin, becoming Abe Lincoln, becoming a penny or a $5 bill. And though Moby and Carl Sagan can say that I am made of stars, it's much more likely that I have sprung from more ordinary awful stuff, broken glass, a leather strap, a chalky stone, manure, or maggots, or nightmare anglerfish. But I like to romanticize the possibilities, what pretty pasts I invent for myself, what wonders I foresee inhabiting, anything other than what I am. And thank you again for this opportunity. I'm going to end with this poem that I started in Joan's wonderful class. Uh, and thank you again, everyone, for being here and sharing your work and for listening. This is called, I Fail in Many Tenses. I make a list of failures. It trails, unwieldy, a weighty Jacob Marley's chain. I fail daily to rejoice at the breath in my lungs, at this long and at this long job of living, at each bowl of hot soup with crackers, at each pile of unraked leaves, at each simple act of being. I walk every day, I run, but still I fail at getting faster, at getting smaller. What are you running from? A friend asks. Death, I answer. And once again, I have failed to articulate the desire to cherish everything, from the dragonfly on my shoulder to the hair my husband leaves in the sink after he shaves. He shaves, so he is alive. Failed to kneel at the temple of birches and oaks in the forest preserve, at the towering skyline of the loop in the distance, at the brine of an olive, at the ache in my back, burning so alive, and I am still failing to explain. But God, give me more chances to be bad at joy, and one of them will stick, I swear. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much, Donna. And thank you, Joan, for bringing these students to our group and being here today to share their work with us. Um, so Susan, you are here all of the way from California, if you'd like to unmute and say a couple of words about your students who have read today, we'd love to hear from you. Oh, good. Okay. 
yeah, I just happened to be just got off a plane. But anyway, I'm really, I just, I, I don't have much to say. I was thinking of what to say, but really I'm very humbled by hearing all of these readers so far. And um, what I just keep thinking is in my class's memoir, and you heard from Sarah and you'll hear from Lynn, um, but really even the poets, I'm not saying it's memoir, it's poetry, but you're writing, as Donna said, people who are working with words. And these are the stories, everybody here, these are the stories that you want to tell and you're finding the ways to tell them. And, you know, so there's, uh, it's great to hear prose and poetry doing that today. That's all I have to say, really, so. Thank you so much, Susan. And now we're going to hear from Lynn. Thank you, Lynn for being with us today. So we have two readers left, Lynn and Alice Green. And here's Lynn. Have we lost Lynn again? Who's there was a message. In, there was a message in the chat earlier that Lynn was having problems with internet stability. She is, and might yes. not be able to read. So okay. Well. I'm so sorry that we can't hear Lynn today. If she does come during Alice's reading, we will we will end with her. But Alice, we would like to hear you now read from your wonderful new manuscript that you're in progress about your life growing up in foster care and and with your um, with your biological parents as well, all four of them who are survivors, who were survivors of World War II. So please, everyone, help me welcome my wonderful student, Alice Green. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Thank you. Um, uh, I'll uh, just uh, say that, yeah, my, my mother was a um, Holocaust survivor, and uh, my father was a survivor of the Russian forced labor camps at the end of World War II and it had a huge impact on them. And as uh, a result, second generational trauma on me. Um, so my first poem is Fosterhood. When my foster sister got new dresses, I got a mottled sweater with a hole, secondhand shoes that nod at my toes, pants that ended at my ankles. My foster parents' justification your parents forgot to pay us again. Your mother is in a hospital bed. Your father is off gambling on horses. You have clothes on your back, food in your belly, and a bed to sleep in. When their daughter shrieked about her clothes, she stomped her heels into the floor. Her mother cried, we can find you something. When I shook my head at a wool biting sweater, her mother wielded the wooden spoon. It landed with a blistering blow. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner, they talked to each other. I ate what was given. Their daughter pouted and pushed food off her plate. Her father yelled at her, pointed his finger at me. Why can't you be more like her? She sits quietly and eats her liver. What visiting guests admired most was seeing her mother caressing my cheek. One night, one night while playing with a one-eyed doll in my pajamas, in the bedroom, in the only home I've ever known, I hear my foster father roar and speak to my father, speak my father's name. I walk down the hall where I took my first steps to the kitchen where I eat each meal. My foster father stands bent over the phone, voice raised, he drills his words into the receiver, into the receiver. You fucking asshole. You owe us three months of money. Your daughter needs new clothes. Do you want us to leave her on the street? My foster mother washes dishes in the sink. Her back is turned. She runs the water to rinse plates clean. She turns her marble eyes on me. The telephone call ends. She asks, if he does not pay, pay us, what do we do with her? I am five years old and see me packed and pushed out onto the street in my pajamas on a cold, wet night. Siren. My mother rolled red around the contours of her button lips, 
painting them the color of stop signs, red lights, and fire trucks. She chose red to warn others when she walked into a room that her words would be loud, like sirens and bells, race like wild animals driven by fear of a fire or foe. No one understood the distress in her voice. It rose from within her, a child in bombing raids, scarred by destruction, loss, and separation from a mother's love. When she left me at my foster home, she kissed my cheek, marking me. Hunger. I have seen those eyes before, the subtle stare that lingers and sums you in the glint of an eye's iridescence. Those eyes that speak for wordless lips that salivate and circle, taste of tender skin. <clears throat> eyes that long to run, rippling fingers along your spine and descend into the cavern at your core. I have seen those eyes before, age deciphered the snake's intent. My life with my foster mother was very difficult. Um, she was uh, raised, um, she grew up being a member of the Nazi Hitler youth and she had very strict ideas about what I should do or what I was allowed to do in the house. Crossing the line. I open the refrigerator door my foster mother forbids me to touch. Her wooden spoon flies and as it strikes, I cry out, your daughter stole a chocolate bar from the store. She shouts for her daughter who peers around the corner. She denies then confesses. I only did it once. The spoon makes rose petals on her skin. When her father learns what she's done, he hits her so hard the spoon breaks. I cry for him to stop promising never to touch their fridge again. My father dreams of racehorses with well-groomed coats trained to reach the finish line. Between his thumb and finger, he pinches a pink ticket for Dolly's girl to win. A parade of chestnut bay and pinto horses prances to the starting gate. The bugle blares, for ticket vendors to stop their sales. They're off, a silence falls, crisp with wonder. A huddle of horses gallop, gallops past them on a sodden track, spraying mud and dirt up their muscular torsos and jockey's breeches. Green, red, yellow, and purple jackets billow in the wind. The an announcer stirs up the spectators. Here comes baby Lou, round the bend. He's passing Betty Sands, Dolly girls neck and neck. Dolly's girl wins the race. Losing tickets fly like autumn leaves and land beneath thin-soled feet. My father forgets his countless losses. Dolly's girl won, that's all that matters. Pills, 1975. This is about my mother. When she takes them, she sits quietly, drinks tea, presses the, head, the beads on her rosary. She makes me pancakes for breakfast, tells me, I love you, as I leave for school. She sleeps all afternoon, sits awake at night. Her body bloats. Without them, she speaks to someone only she can see. I ask her to stop. She says, shut up. Like a red flailing flag, I persist. Please stop. A black furious bull charges from her chair. The mistake. Awake, I hear his keys unlatch the apartment door. He's home and is the reason for my visit. I step into the unlit hall. We are faceless forms and could be anyone. Hello, I whisper. He walks toward me and lays his lips on mine. The warmest greeting from him I have ever known. He hugs me and bends to kiss my neck. When I say, dad, he recoils. My poker game's ended at three. Why, why are you up? Go to bed. He had been 
It had been three months since I'd last seen him. I was then the height of the second wife. This last one is a prose poem. Um, my uh, biological father uh, took me out of my foster home when I was six years old, only to take me on a, a voyage um, to across the Atlantic to Germany to, to see my grandmother, who was my namesake. And um, uh, my foster parents thought this was going to be a great opportunity for me to bond with my father. So here goes called My Father's Women. When I was six, my, father, my father's girlfriend, Doris, drove us to the bus terminal. At every red light, she dabbed at her eyes with a wrinkled tissue. My father kissed her for a long time while waiting passengers lined up for the bus behind us. The bus driver took two tickets from my father, then nodded to me to climb in. With my father sitting next to me, we waved to Doris as the bus pulled onto the street. I spoke to my baby doll while my father scanned a magazine filled with naked women. Preparing to fall asleep, I wrapped my doll in a blanket and covered myself with my jacket. I woke to the horn of the ocean liner waiting for us at New York Harbor. On deck, men in gold button uniforms greeted us, our cabin, had bunk beds and a porthole, half covered by algae green water, the other half blue sky. That first night, my father turned off the light and left me alone in my bunk. I hugged my doll and told her she didn't need to be afraid of the dark. The ship held a welcome ball, adults only. Ladies wore long evening gowns. In the morning, he was in his bunk. On the second night, he disappeared again. The following morning, his bunk was empty. Instead, he arrived in time to go for breakfast and dropped me at the ship's nursery, a room filled with children's toys and an indoor slide. The third night, he introduced me to a new lady friend, Lizzie. She had blonde, silky, shining hair and block eye-lined, eye crystal clear blue eyes. Every night, she kissed me and my doll goodnight and left the cabin with my father. On the last day of the voyage, I said goodbye to a girl I met in the nursery. Her mother greeted me in their, cab their cabin. She gave me a pendant and her telephone number and said, give this to your father. He's quite the gentleman. When the ship arrived at Bremenhaven, my father and I had a tearful goodbye with Lizzie. She gave me a doll blonde like her with long black eyelashes and eyes the color of crystal blue water. My father kissed her for a long time as passengers lined up to dis disembark. On shore that night, I followed my father to a phone booth to the harbor terminal to call Doris. Before he dialed his number, he whispered to me, don't say a word about Lizzie. I placed the Lizzie doll in a bag and waited for him holding my baby doll close to my heart. I think I have time for one more, um, if I can. It's called Undressed. Undressed, preening before the mirror down to my underpants and training bra with its white flowers, my long stem legs giving me height. My mother tries on the eyes of a man. She leers and says, men will want you. I shudder at her reflection. Goosebumps appear. In seconds, I'm reduced from a young Venus to a naked chicken, cellophane wrapped in the fridge of a local grocery store. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Alice. I can't wait for your book to come out and Thank same you. goes to Ellen. Thanks I'm really proud of all of you. And I know that Susan and Joan feel the same way. Let's all come in for a group shot. Um, at the end, we can we can pin all of the authors and Joan Kwan Glass and Susan Hadara to on the screen, um, so we can we can take a group shot um, of all the writers. Um, thank you, Ellen. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, we have Misty. Thank you, Joan. And now we just need Susan.
I think we may have lost Susan. Okay, we may have lost her connection. Okay, well, let's do this, a picture with this. Everyone smile. Thank you all for reading. Thank you all in the audience for coming. Please check out work online by these wonderful writers. Please sign up for classes. Please sign up for the gala or make a donation. And we can't wait to see you back here next week on August 6th at 4 p.m. on Zoom or in person for part two of our published student reading. Thank you all so much. Have a wonderful night. Thank you, Joan. Thanks, Sophia. Thanks to all the writers.